I find people tend to get tied up in knots when it comes to complications of endovascular aneurysm repair, so let's see if we can simplify it a bit. First, let's classify them. We can divide complications of EVAR into complications common to any and all procedures, complications common to all major vascular procedures, and EVAR-specific complications. Firstly, we have complications which may occur with any type of procedure. Common examples include bleeding, infection, venous thromboembolism, hypersensitivity reactions, chronic pain, and scarring. Next, we have complications which may occur with any major vascular procedure. These include myocardial infarction at about 1 in 50, stroke at about 1 in 100, renal failure requiring dialysis, again about 1 in 100, and death, usually from myocardial infarction or stroke, about 1 in 50. Then we have the EVAR specific complications. These include limb loss at a risk of about 1 in 50, graft thrombosis, and endoleaks, which cause more confusion than anything else. The risk of limb loss with an EVAR is about 1 in 50. These patients often have pre-existing peripheral arterial disease. Sometimes large stent delivery devices can damage the access vessels. Alternatively, low flow distal to the large introducers can cause thrombosis in situ in pre-existing PAD segments. Clot can form around the introducers, which may be knocked off in the bloodstream leading to an embolus. Any of these mechanisms can produce either acute or acute on chronic ischemia perioperatively, which if not recognized and dealt with promptly, can result in limb loss. Once the stent graft is in place, one of the limbs of the graft may become occluded. This can occur at any time from implantation to many years following the procedure. Just as when a native artery becomes occluded, it can produce any of acute limb ischemia, claudication, or chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Endoleaks are the quintessential EVAR-specific complication, as they can only occur following EVAR. They cannot occur following open aneurysm repair. There are five types, and they can occur at any time. Type 1 endoleaks occur when there is a leak either at the top or the bottom of the endograft. In a 1A endoleak, the leak is at the top of the graft in the aorta. Remember, A for aorta. In a 1B endoleak, the leak is at the bottom in one of the iliac seal zones. So remember, 1B, bottom leak. The significance of these leaks is that the aneurysm sac remains pressurized, so they still carry the same risk of rupture as if the aneurysm had never been treated. The most common type of endoleak is a type 2 endoleak. In this type, back bleeding occurs into the sac, usually from lumbar vessels, but sometimes from the inferior mesenteric artery or the median sacral artery. These leaks can develop at any time following graft implantation. Usually they are benign and we just keep an eye on them, but if the sac starts to enlarge, the endoleak may need to be treated, most often by embolization. A type 3 endoleak occurs when the graft components become separated from each other. The result is a high pressure leak into the aneurysm sac. So the aneurysm is pressurized again and the patient is at risk of a rupture again. Type 4 endoleaks are uncommon. They are thought to be due to the slow seepage of blood through tiny microscopic pores in the material covering the stent graft. They are difficult to diagnose, and you may just notice that the sac is getting larger on serial scans. The final type of endoleak is a type 5 endoleak. This is poorly understood. 
the patient's aneurysm sac expands on surveillance CTs, but there's no obvious source of a leak. It's thought or postulated that it may be due to pressure transmitted from the material of the stent graft through thrombus in the sac to the wall. And there is sometimes an overlap with a type 4 endoleak. Thanks for watching. The revision notes are available to download for free at vascularchutor.com.